the type. This is the Ahiravata engine, an engine without a crankshaft, which moves as shown in the video. Its main component is the flower, and it provides movement at a constant speed to the output shaft. Hence, it's called a CV engine, that means constant velocity. This design eliminates the need for a connecting rod, which normally has to be tilted in order to produce torque. When the rod is perfectly vertical, it generates no thrust. Precisely at the point where the combustion chamber is smallest and cylinder pressure is at its highest. The main advantage of the rod rack is similar to that of cylinder offset, but with an offset, there's a limit until what you gain on one side is lost on the other. The creators, knowing they needed to attract investors with a real engine rather than just 3D computer models, assembled a two-stroke engine like this one. Inside, we can see the flower mechanism in action. And as if that were not enough, we also see it running, burning fuel. They also assembled a four-stroke engine. According to them, they obtained promising results. So today, we're going to analyze it in detail to see what it's all about. Personally, I believe that any engine that is built and moves is worthy of being shown on this channel, regardless of whether it's viable or not. Time will tell. Let's start from the beginning in a simplified way. First, we have the power shaft, which should replace the crankshaft of a conventional engine. As we can see, it has timing teeth of different lengths. Now we add the flower. This flower has notches to lock onto the shaft and rotate. In addition, the flower has channels. These channels guide pins, which in turn move this rectangle. This component is called the rod rack. We can see that at times, one pin passes through the outside of the flower, while the other goes inside, and vice versa. That is, the flower has two paths simultaneously. Additionally, this rectangle has two teeth to interact with the shaft. If we pay attention, we see that the teeth pass through, but in reality, if we look from the side, we can see that the teeth are of different lengths so that each one pushes when it's supposed to. These teeth exist solely to maintain synchronization and compensate for thermal expansion. They also guide the rectangle during transitions between channels. As we can observe, at certain moments the pins lose contact with the flower and slides, guided only by the gear teeth. Remember that in a gear-to-gear -gear engagement, only one to two teeth per gear are performing the power transfer, so this system doesn't seem so crazy. Now we add the pistons. These are shaped to fit and attach to the rod rack, and then a screw tightens and holds them in place. It also uses interchangeable liners. These are real images of them. At the front, we have another flower, just like the previous one. This one is so the pin works on both sides. You can also see the teeth working. The rod rack runs along these lubricated guides, eliminating the contact of the pistons with the cylinders. At the rear, we have a camshaft fitted to the power shaft, which controls the valves using rods. Here, you can see the mechanism with the rockers and how everything works. You can also see the crown, the tone wheel, the RPM sensor, and the orange ones are coils. Then we have the oil pump, which is driven by a gear and is of the Gerotor type. Here's the water pump. These pipes we see feed each cylinder head to cool it, and then these pipes come out and go to the radiator. This housing is for the thermostat. It has the air filter, the intake manifold. Now we add the injectors and spark plugs. We install the starter motor, and that's it. The engine is complete. Now we see the four stroke. We have intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust. This engine we're looking at is 0.5 liter, has a 75 millimeter bore and a 58 millimeter stroke, and is designed to only rev at 2000 RPM maximum. Now in the two stroke version, it's basically the same, but we remove the valves from above. We use this cylinder with ports. The pistons have a skirt, but only to open and close the ports and the rod is longer. 
We add this lid underneath to seal, and now it does the intake through this port. The piston then pushes the mixture into the cylinder, after which it moves upward to carry out the compression stroke, combustion, and exhaust. So, what is the advantage of this rod rack? In a conventional engine, combustion occurs when the chamber volume is minimal, creating peak pressure on the piston. However, due to the unfavorable connecting rod to crank angle, this pressure cannot be effectively converted into torque. The crank must rotate several degrees, during which cylinder pressure decreases as the chamber expands before optimal leverage is achieved. At that point, the available power has already diminished significantly, resulting in energy losses. By using a rod rack, you avoid using a con rod, so the angle problem disappears, but not entirely. For example, at this point, we still have the problem. Maybe if the rack is extended, it would be solved. Now, let's look at the advantages claimed by its inventors. 1. When combustion occurs and is discharged into the flower's ramp system, which is optimized with a special geometry, it obtains 40% more energy than the crankshaft system and this gain is obtained from 6.75 degrees of rotation. Actually, much earlier than the crank connecting rod system that its maximum delivery occurs from 10 to 20 degrees. It's the equivalent of having variable cylinder offset throughout the stroke. Two, another advantage is that this system of ramps and gears ensures that the piston maintains the same speed throughout 85% of its travel. The slowdown occurs right at the extremes and is constant. To balance vibrations, a flat 8 engine would cancel them out perfectly. 3. The pistons move at a constant speed, creating a more stable flow of incoming and outgoing gases. This improves gas flow and cylinder filling, producing more power. 4. In a crank connecting rod engine, the piston moves faster in one direction and slower in the other. This happens because when we break down the rotational motion, the crankshaft moves downward and at the same time toward the center, which makes the piston rise more slowly. On the opposite side, the crankshaft moves upward and also toward the center, causing the piston to rise faster. Although a four-cylinder engine may appear balanced, it actually vibrates due to these differences in piston speed. This is also why the piston does not reach maximum speed at 50% of the stroke, but somewhat later. The graph shows how much it deviates from smooth motion. 5. There is no volume change in the crankcase. Since both pistons move up and down simultaneously, no compression or vacuum is created, which prevents oil seals from failing and stops the engine from losing fluids. It also avoids power losses, as there is no gas compression. This advantage depends on the engine configuration. For example, in an inline four-cylinder engine, volume variation is minimal. 6. There's no lateral force from the piston to the cylinder liners. This is why the pistons have almost no skirt. Friction is reduced and there's no cylinder out of roundness caused by piston pitch. Because the rod rack runs on lubricated guides attached to the block, the rings wear evenly without becoming oval, increasing their service life. 7. By having a 50% improvement in power delivery, an engine with half the displacement could be made and use half the fuel. Obviously, this is what they're trying to certify now. Since the engine is very new, there are no results yet. 8. In a two-stroke engine, since the pistons don't touch the cylinder walls, the use of oil in the mixture could be minimized. The sealed part below the piston serves as a chamber to draw in air, as in a normal two-stroke engine, and then send it to the combustion chamber through ports. All this without burning oil. The crankcase still contains oil as usual. 9. It could be used on container ships. Conventional two-stroke diesel engines are very tall and can only be installed in line, so flat configurations are not possible. The Ahiravada engine, being more efficient, could be half the size and could also be mounted flat on the floor, improving the ship's center of gravity and reducing the impact of waves. Obviously, the ship is huge, it wouldn't affect that much. 10. Its low weight also makes it suitable for use in aircraft, drones, cars, and other vehicles. 11. When used with hydrogen or faster-burning fuels like ethanol, its power can be better utilized at the top of the stroke. And 12. By having a hollow shaft, internal shafts can be passed through and connected to clutches within a transmission. Similar to how a dual-clutch gearbox works, engines can be connected according to the required power demand.
Disadvantages 1. The piston decelerates only during the final part of the stroke. As a result, this section is quite abrupt and requires a larger flywheel to compensate. However, the flower ramp design can also be adjusted to smooth out the motion as needed. 2. The engine can only be configured in pairs and with opposed pistons. For example, a single-cylinder engine could not be built for a motorcycle. 3. The gear teeth are very small and might look like they could break, since at 50% of the travel they have to transfer power during the transition from one pin to the next. However, according to the inventors, this happens for a very brief moment and the teeth do not flex. They exist solely for synchronization. Also, the rack and teeth could be built wider. That said, watching the animation still raises some serious doubts. But let's not forget, just like in a pair of gears, only one or two teeth per gear are in contact. And 4. The ramp pushing pin system has a lot of friction, and if we break down the centerline positions, we can see that a force breakdown similar to that of the crankshaft occurs. This force will depend on the angle of attack on the ramp and the distance from the centerline. In any case, it's true that it can be adjusted until favorable results are achieved, but for now, the engine must continue to be developed and we'll see what happens. In total, this engine is made up of 338 parts if you count each screw, spark plug, injector, piston, and seal individually. It's basically a standard number compared to other engines, therefore it has neither fewer nor more parts. There's also another version with a timing chain and overhead camshafts with four cylinders and also this little single-piston two-stroke. One was removed so you can see it better, but the engine has two pistons. The website states the latest update was in April 2025 and that the engine is now undergoing new horsepower and fuel consumption tests at an international certification body. As I told you, I thought it was a very interesting engine to show you and we'll see how it goes. What do you think of this engine? Do you think it can go far? Or will it simply not work? leave your opinion in the comments, hit the like button, and don't forget to follow me. You can also check out my other videos. See you next time!